What's going on, Packers fans? Aaron Nagler here, joined by Ben Fennel yet again to talk some NFL Combine. Coming up next week, we are both headed to Indy. Ben, can't wait to see you there, buddy. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. I love Indianapolis, and that week, it's just kind of the football purist capital of the world that time of year. It's nothing but GM, scouts, prospects, a lot of media, and the conversation is nothing but draft and prospect dominant. Yeah, maybe some hiring cycle stuff, some free agent rumors, some movement stuff that kind of picks up steam, but it's a really fun week of the football community. I love how you put it, too, the football kind of purist-centric. It's all football, all the time for a good week, 24 hours a day, and the entire NFL world essentially is there. I did want to ask you, before we dive into um, kind of what I wanted to talk about today, which is kind of previewing some prospects as far as the Packers' positions of need, some guys that Packers fans should be looking out for next week in Indy. Before we get to get, get to that, I do want to ask you one other kind of aspect of the combine that has kind of slowly been changing. And it kind of relates to what we've just been talking about as far as the entire NFL world, right, descending on Indy for this week of the Combine. However, kind of a new trend now, and it's growing seemingly every year. The Packers joined these ranks last season, and they're continuing to do so this year, is coaching staffs staying away. And obviously there are some staffs that have been doing this for a bit. I know Sean McVay and the Rams have kind of stayed away for the last several years. But like I said, Matt LaFleur joined those ranks Last season, he's he and his staff are staying away again this year. What do you make of that? Is that more a case of, you know, we, we're going to get a lot more done if we just stick around the facility for a week rather than go down to Indy? Or is it a kind of a trying to keep guys away from networking and trying to maybe hoard your talent a little bit? Yeah, I actually didn't consider the networking aspect of it within the coaching ranks. But right. my perspective is what your philosophy is for the week. And for a lot of teams, this is information gathering not evaluation. So I think these teams that just want to gather information, technology is great. You know, digital right. nature of this world's great. You could get that information and not having gone there. Now the coaches that want to evaluate and feel the players and talk to them up close right. and bring it a little bit more into a personal evaluation, whether it's an on-field evaluation of the workout, whether it's a personal evaluation, whether it's a medical evaluation, whatever it is, if you're diving a little bit deeper into figuring out the highs and lows of these kids that week, yes, you want boots on the ground. But if it's just, uh, hey, we want the medical reports, we want you know all their height, weight, speed reports, and we can easily get that in our email the second after it happens, we can be much more resourceful you know, being back at the home facility, just putting on our NFL network coverage and watching along on TV like so many people do at home. I think right. they could get just as much, if not more, done uh, kind of in that vein. It makes a lot of sense. And I think we're going to probably arrive at a place at some point where most of the staffs are at home. Right now, I think they're up to like 12 or 13, somewhere around there. Um, like and Aaron, said, that, you, that you trend can feel it during grow. the broadcast, too. You know, when the drills oh, yeah. are going on and you're, you, you know, have cameras kind of going around the, the bowl there looking for coaches in the booth. Yes, and sir. you see them in other booths with their back to the field, talking, right. things like that. Right. It just kind of alludes to the importance of what's on the field and the emphasis and the priority. Um, and I think as you see that more and more, you start to kind of restack the emphasis of what's happening that week and where you can acquire that information elsewhere. And I think some teams are kind of uh, maybe ebbing and flowing a little bit different than the, the philosophies and the trends had been. And I think you're, you're spot on in regards to it's information gathering rather than evaluation because the evaluation mm -hmm. is the tape, right? I mean, that's yeah. what you, know, you, you want guys going off of. Um, speaking of the tape and speaking of, you know, these guys being on the carpet there at Indy next week, I, I, w I did want to kind of look ahead and give Packers fans a couple of guys at each position of need as we perceive them. Uh, you know, they kind of look out for guys that maybe, you know, they're not thinking about right now, but are going to jump off in your estimation, going to jump off the uh, the screen, as it were, or, or the turf there at Indy. Um, let's start at inside backer or just linebacker in general, because I do think, you know, the further we get along into uh, this offseason, right, and what the Packers want to do on the defensive side of the ball, we're going to hear from Jeff Halfley later today, kind of maybe our first kind of crack, so to speak, at understanding what it is he wants to do. But I do think the linebacker position is going to look pretty different next year in Green Bay. Uh, are there a, uh, it's a couple guys that maybe you think are going to either test well or look really good or, you know, jump off maybe or jump out 
from the crowd next week in India at backer. Yeah, I think there's a handful. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be a day one linebacker that's kind of in the Packers' sights. There really isn't one this class based on traits, production, positional value, projection. There isn't that Quay Walker, that Jack Campbell uh, kind of upside. But right on early day two, you're looking at some guys like Peyton Wilson from NC State, Cedric Gray. These are the guys I call the combo backers. These are three down backers. They're great forward, backwards, laterally, smart kids, experience. They're both going to test exceptionally well. Peyton Wilson's going to be the darling of the week. He's going to test like Jack Campbell, about 10 pounds lighter. He's going to jump close to 38, 40 inches, run in the four fours. He's going to move outstanding. I mean, he's run down wide receivers on his film. You could see that athleticism, that playmaking ability all over the place. He's going to look great in shorts and t-shirts. The other class of linebacker, the explosives. This is the Edger and Cooper out of Texas A&M. This is the Trevin Wallace out of Kentucky. These guys are big at 6'3", 240, and can absolutely run and hit. They're going to look great in a straight line. They're going to be explosive in their jumps. These are guys that are playmakers. I think would be great will linebacker fits at the NFL. Just let them run, chase, and hit things. A lot like our own Quay Walker there. Mm. So a little bit of repetitive skill set there. I'm looking for the Packers to get what I call a CEO type. I want a... <laughs> You know, a uh, Junior Carlson out of Michigan, a Jeremiah Trotter Jr., a Tommy Eichenberg, smart, experienced, tough, leaders, not coming off the field. But they do have some limitations, whether it's going into reverse and coverage, maybe pure play speed, maybe their play strength. But these are guys that are just good football players. So I think classifying in not only day one, day two, day three, but then the type of linebackers that each of these kind of represent thing is really important. So remember what we have, Quay Walker, Isaiah McDuffie there, which are two very different linebackers. It's time to find some complementative players to kind of fill in between them. So I would really love a CEO, Mike linebacker, call the defense, not come off the field. Let Quay Walker be a run and chase guy, maybe a sub rusher and some sub packages in third down and kind of take some of the mental strain off of him. And then if you just want maybe those exciting playmakers, we had talked about it, Wilson, Gray, Cooper, Trevin Wallace, I think in round two, those four guys are going to be right there for the Packers. Moving back on the defensive side of the ball to the safety position, it's fascinating to watch kind of the discourse play out over the course of the last couple of weeks. Now people are really starting to dive into the tape, but I always kind of reserve judgment, so to speak, as far as who's going to be available for the Packers, but just in general, until after the athletic testing gets done, because we know, especially at this, this position, it feels like this is a week in Indy during the combine where these guys can make a lot of money. Like as far as maybe they haven't been asked to do certain things in college, right? But all of a sudden they test out of the water and people start daydreaming about, oh, we could ask, we could do this with him. We could do that with him <laughs> just because they've seen now an example of possibly some athleticism that didn't jump off the screen, so to speak, on the tape. Uh, are there any yeah. or which safeties, I, I guess I should say, should Packers fans have their eye on in that regard next week during the combine? Well, there's going to be some thick ones that I think can play that kind of too high. They can play some quarters and then they're going to roll down and play in the box. And that's uh, Jaden Hicks out of Washington State, who I think is going to be one of the premier safeties to get here on day two. Right there with Tyler Newbin. Similar style and size players with good ball skills deep, but guys that can come downhill, can hit, can tackle, and they're really athletic players. And there's also some day three linebackers that embody that as well. I think Curtis Jacobs out of Penn State is going to test outstanding next week. Michael Barrett out of Michigan, high school quarterback, over 600 special team snaps in his career. He's about six foot 225. That's not far off from today's strong safety. If you test well, you can play in space, you're smart, you've had some experience on the offensive side. I just love high school quarterbacks converted to linebacker. That's, <laughs> that's Temple's Jordan yeah. McGee, too, who's 6'2", 225, a little bit light, but really athletic, really speedy, good on special teams, good in coverage. So I think that safety spot, especially that strong safety spot, can come from a variety of different spots, whether it's the smaller linebacker, whether it's that bigger safety. Um, and I think the Packers are going to kind of look at a hodgepodge of players and maybe multiple players to kind of add to that room and add competition and definitely get some younger new blood in that room. Speaking of competition, let's flip it over to the offensive side, because I know it's very defensive centric this offseason, as most offseasons are in Green Bay. But I do think competition wise, I think they're going to be looking at offensive guard. I don't think for a moment that they're set 
along their offensive line. I know, no question about it, Sean Ryan looked good down the stretch and, and certainly made a case to at least compete for a starting job next year. But I think there's a decent chance that the Packers will look at guards this year, maybe not early, maybe not a premium pick, but who are some guys that may help state their case, so to speak, next week in Indy? Because this is a team in the Green Bay Packers who has had an amazing track record as far as finding guys who maybe aren't, you know, day one guys, but they certainly have found guards, tackles who become, can become guards, athletes who, you know, you talk about athleticism, you start to really discover that in Indianapolis. Aaron, sitting here today on February 22nd, I would be stunned if the Packers didn't use their first round pick on an offensive lineman. I just think it's Ooh, too deep at the top call right there, Ben Fennel. this year. I just think there's too big of a positional drop off. I just think that's where you get your value and your stud players in this league, particularly on the offensive side of the ball in that cornerback spot. I know is also a popular picking spot for yeah. the Packers, but sitting there with Jair and an Eric Stokes in the room at the moment with Carrington Valentin, I just find that to be a little bit too much depth there in high-level draft capital, adding to an already kind of sturdy cornerback room, at least on paper. So I think figuring out do they envision Eric Stokes, a peg starter for 2024, is going to be a huge kind That's of offseason. Big leap of faith, right? There. You know, philosophical decision. But right. I just think the offensive linemen in this class, whether it's tackle or the guards like we're about to talk about, are going to be right there for the Packers. And that's going to be the Talis Fuaga out of Oregon State, who a lot of people think are starting tackles right now. He could slide and play guard as well. And I think this is going to get right to that middle of the first round where the Packers are going to have their pick at a lot of these guard centers, whether it's Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon, whether it's Zach Frazier out of West Virginia, whether it's Graham Barton, who has that interesting tackle center experience, a lot like Cody Whitehair had uh, out of Kansas State a few years back. And then there's a bunch on day two, whether it's Troy Fuanta from Washington, who's also a guard tackle, Christian Haynes, uh, Dominic Pooney has played tackle, guard, center, Christian Mahogany, Cooper Baby, Bo Limmer. There's going to be just, I think, 10, 12 guys for the Packers in round one and round two to consider that have starting traits and starting ability. And I just think it would be a huge mistake not to add higher level draft capital talent to this offensive line room. It's been very impressive how the way they survived this last year with a seventh <laughs> round pick, left tackle, a day three right, right tackle on Zach Tom, obviously a journeyman undrafted there in uh, the Virginia Tech kid. I'm blanking on his name that played in 2022, but uh, Yash Nyman. Nyman, yeah. Nyman, yep. So I just think addressing this with some higher draft capital talent this is the time to do it with that franchise quarterback that they uh, fell right into there in Jordan Love. No doubt. I mean, it is a philosophical thing, right? As far as you want to make sure that guy is protected. And I remember Ron Wolf talking about this. Like, it's the premium, the absolute paramount job as a general manager. I mean, hell, you don't have to look much further than the Colts and the job they didn't do protecting Andrew Luck and what that led to. I hear you. I'm, I'm fascinated to see how they approach it because – at this point, they've got a good track record, right, of finding those day three guys, coaching them up, making them probably more than serviceable. But I, I do appreciate exactly what you're talking about as far as, okay, let's now get some premium capital invested along the offensive line. Even though you have a great track record working with these day three guys. Those hits you, are such a drug, Aaron. You know, the they Bakhtiari's, really are. How can they not be? Yeah, Bakhtiari and Zach Tom alone. The Langs, the like sit of the world. Okay, we're pretty good at this, you know? Yeah, I know. I but it. no team, and I know every a lot of Packers fans go back to that, but no team expects to find those starters yes. on day three. Right. You hope it happens. You hope every day three is a Hall of Famer that you <laughs> got a huge Everyone's you know, Donald uh, value on. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> it's great that it has happened, and there is a trend of it happening, but the expectation of it are very dangerous so by no means do i think they should pass on player a because right. they can find player f later and it's the same guy no. that is a dangerous game maybe they've danced that dance a few times in the past and it's worked out it would be dangerous to expect i hope every player ends up being a hall of famer not just in the packers but across the league just not how it happens but i root for everybody's success it would just be a little bit risky, I think, going in once again with that kind of spin the wheel on a day three player that you probably need to play right away. Yeah, there's a, there's a chance they'll have to they'll have to compete and they'll be able to compete. There's zero doubt about that. 
Um, let's flip back over finally to the defensive side and talk about corner because you didn't mention it. And yes, I understand your viewpoint as far as, you know, where they are corner wise and they don't have to invest premium capital. I think there's a decent chance they do, uh, especially since, you know, yes, Valentine played well, seventh rounder, probably, you know, I'll kicked his coverage, so to speak, as far as the m- amount he played and the level he played at. Eric Stokes is a total wild card. You don't know if you're going to be able to count on him at all. And I just think with the amount of nickel and dime you're playing in this league, you got to roll deep at that position. Um, who are some guys that maybe, you know, they don't have to be day one guys, but guys who will kind of jump off the the athletic testing kind of radar, so to speak, next week in Indy that maybe possibly the Packers could, you know, look to or have interest in. Well, the popular one, which we had just heard from our own Dane Brugler at The Athletic, Cooper DeGene, saying he will not be working out in, 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 in Indianapolis. So, mm. unfortunately, we expected him to be one of those testing darlings with his prolific uh, high school background, multi-sport player, not to mention a prolific player at Iowa that can play some corner, some nickel, some safety, maybe even play some sub linebacker. He's definitely one of the interesting prospects of this class we were excited to see but won't. So that next tier, you know, that Terry and Arnold's of the world, the Kamari Lassiter's of the world, the SEC corners are all going to steal the show. Big, long, explosive, fast, rangy, fluid. They check all the boxes. Now it's just a matter of would they be there in the middle of the first round, back end of round one for the Packers, or would they have to go up and get one? So I think DJ, uh, Daniel Jeremiah, Ma Cooper DeGene, I think Dean initially had Terry and Arnold to the Packers right at the end of the season before the Packers found themselves with a late 20-something draft pick. Now they've pushed that defensive back spot Dane has to round two, where he had them taking a Jaden Hicks or a Kalen King out of Penn State, who's a nickel. So on day two, you have TJ Tampa out of Iowa State, big, strong, massive corner, who maybe not can't turn and run as well. So once you get to those <laughs> right. next tier of corners, there's going to be some chinks in the armor there. There's going to be some issues. And this is when you get to the smaller guys, the Jarvis Brownlee out of Louisville, a little bit small, probably going to play nickel, the Missouri corners, and Abrams Drain and Brakeshaw, both about 175 pounds. So they don't necessarily have the play profile to play outside in the NFL. So there's some really good players on day two into day three, like Kyrie Jackson, Cam Hart, who are 6'2", 6'3", corners out there. Really interested to see what the Packers want out of some of these uh, position spots with a new defensive coordinator. I, love, I think I love Rake Straw. I'll say, yeah, he's I a really good player. Kid. Very competitive. He's tough. He can he run. tackles. He just yep. he tackles at the position, which is obviously a very rare occurrence in Green hey, Bay. We only get I eleven just... out there. Everyone's got to tackle. <laughs> I know gotta... Deion Sanders said, "Hey, these shoot mm. these suits are for er, these sh- shoulders are for suits," but only so <laughs> many corners can say that out there. So everybody needs to tackle. There's some really tough guys out there. Rake Straw certainly a little undersized, but he's feisty. A little bit, but I love. Yeah. I just love his approach to the game. No doubt about it, Ben. Can't thank you enough for taking the time, chatting it up. I can't wait to see you in Indy, brother. I'll see you next week, and thanks again uh, for coming on Cheesehead TV. See you in Elmo's.